coming up. I use my head properly. Yes. The discoveries. It seems we have some sort of penis here. And will it run? Welcome back to part 6 of Project Chicago. In the previous episode we reunited the car with a freshly rebuilt engine and now we are continuing the parts reinstallation marathon as we come closer to our goal, the first start. And now we're going to do the fuel filter. Alpina of course uses Alpina specific fuel filter which means it's not available as OE or aftermarket. You can only get it directly from the dealer. And this is the most expensive fuel filter I ever bought in my life, 155 euros for that over there basically a label a badge something that normally costs 15 20 euros but it is what it is we have freshly cleaned injectors so fresh fuel filter is a must here the fuel filter lives right over here which means we have to remove this plastic cover and the car did have a bit of a whoopsie here on both sides so someone bottomed out at some point but it's not too bad Oh, it seem, seems we have some sort of penis here. But there's the fuel filter. And I don't know why they did this, but they made a soft rubber line bonded with the metal one. So when this perishes, you have to replace the whole freaking thing, which is just moronic, but it doesn't look too bad in this case. So we're just gonna replace the filter. Maybe it was replaced, because that's not the original VW clamp. Seven doesn't fit, six doesn't fit. So it must be some weird American unit all right that's removed Some nasty fuel coming out of there i don't think there should be any fuel there must mean that the diaphragm is bad in the in the regulator this one has the anti-tamper screws which why would you do that on the fuel filter <laughs> oh <laughs> spilled about Three bucks of fuel there. Ah, it's fairly clean. Normally when I replace these, the fuel that's coming out is just disgusting. Before we put the new fuel filter in, I want to flush this line here. It was sitting sort of open at the top for five months while we're waiting on all of this. And I don't want that old fuel to end up in freshly cleaned injectors. So I'm just going to get an air hose here and blow it out. Good, that's nice and clean now. Clip in that. All right. Before we leave, let's put a date on it. What date is it? September 2056. Is that good? Let's give it a smiley. Happy filter. This is the supercharger, which worked fine before I removed it, I think. But now we're going to service it. We're not going to do a full rebuild, but there is some stuff that we can do that's not too difficult and the supercharger is going to benefit from. For example, we're going to replace the clutch bearings, these two guys here. And I also noticed that the housing is wet, so it's leaking a little bit. So we're gonna take it apart completely and replace all of the O-rings and seals and stuff. There's about 15 million of them. I also checked the impeller. It has no play whatsoever, so we're not going to touch that. I got this kit from Laszlo from Budapest. He has a website dedicated to these superchargers. He's offering a rebuild service, selling parts for them, and just million information about these specific superchargers on there. I'll leave the link to his website in the description. And I also found a really good video from Vasil from California, b7stuff.com. He has a really good video how to take this thing apart properly and put it back together. So I'm going to follow that and hopefully we can do this without any issues. So first thing we're going to do is clean it on the outside and just make sure all of this dirt doesn't end up on the inside. That should do it. All right, we have a clean working surface and a clean supercharger. So first I'm going to remove this thing here. So there's the impeller. I'm gonna change this gasket later as well. I already checked and made sure that this doesn't have any play whatsoever. I'm gonna remove this pipe here. First, we're gonna start with the clutch bearing. 
So I'm gonna close this side up so nothing can go in there. The clutch assembly lives behind this pulley, so we gotta remove that first. The clutch friction pads look good. Smells like shit, but looks good. Remove the plate. The f Didn't know there were balls there. One just left the building. So this happened, but I found the stupid thing. So there are four balls here with springs behind them. And on these two, the thing that keeps them in place snapped. So that's why they fell out. Don't think that'll hurt anything. I just need to be careful when I put all of this back together. So now I'm gonna move this bolt and this big spacer. Don't think this thing was ever apart. We have the clutch removal tool, which allows the cells. There it is. So the clutch thickness should be minimum two millimeters. And we are at nearly four. So that should be fine. Now you're gonna hold a press conference and press the bearing out. Let's set it on a cup. And I have a 30 mil socket that I need to flip around in order to fit perfectly and push out the bearing. I think that's as far as my socket will go. 25 mil one would sit perfectly on it, but I don't have 25 mil. Who has that? Should be out. Or it hit the bottom of my cup. There's one. Ooh, there's a shim there. Don't lose that. That's the two bearings pressed out. We have a shim in the middle, which we'll need to clean and put back. This one doesn't seem too bad, but this one is just, it's falling apart. All the grease came out, get our new bearings. And these are exactly the same. So I'm gonna clean this up a little bit and then we're gonna press the new bearings in. Not gonna use brake cleaner here whatsoever. We can damage the friction pads. This is now nice and clean and ready for the new bearings. Now the second bearing. That's it. <coughs> Sitting fully flush on the back, which is good. So this is good to go in. Now I'm gonna clean up the tools and this thing here, and then we can put it back together. All right, everything is clean and ready for assembly. And now we simply screw it in. All right, we reached the end of this travel. Clean spacer, brand new bolt, and we are going to apply medium thread locker and torque it to 25 newton meters. Now I'm gonna put back the springs, the balls, and then a clean plate. Pulley, which I thoroughly cleaned. The torque for the pulley bolts is 10 newton meters.
Is it me or it sounds a lot quieter? So much quieter. Now we're going to start with the O-ring replacement. The first O-ring is here. Clean that up later. So there's the spacer that was stuck on this side, but there's an O-ring here that we also need to replace. We're going to mark the case. There is a dowel somewhere in here that's going to tell us which way it goes back together, but one line, why not? So this one here is shorter than the others. Now we have slots here and here. So we're going to engage some screwdriver action. But we're going to put tape on them to protect the aluminum casing. There it is. So there are two O-rings here. We're going to put this on the side for now. And next we need to remove the impeller housing. So we need to pull this thing upwards. Voila, not a big seal here. It's very sharp. Two clean rubber blocks. So we can flip this over. And it's gonna rest on the plate and not the impeller. And now we need to remove these two helical gears. Two four mil hex bolts. These have Loctite on them. <clears throat> Now I need to lift them out. Now we need to undo this plate. Wait a minute, the impeller wants to come out. Okay. That was a lot easier than I was expecting. So the impeller came out rather easily. This is the seal that we need to replace. It's completely flat and that's why it just slipped out. And be very gentle with this. This spins at 90,000 RPM. And then there are two shims here as well that we mustn't lose. And then this plate has an o-ring there as well. So this is the complete thing disassembled. So now we're going to start replacing o-rings. Two big ones the biggest one. All right, we're going to start with this plate here. So I'm going to cut and remove the old o-ring because it's hard as a rock and I don't want to damage this thing. And this is a dull tool. And no damage to the plate. This is plastic. So this is now nice and clean. Grab our new o-ring. Need to oil it up and then slide it over. And just make sure that this is seated correctly. Put back the shim. Now we're going to do the impeller. And this thing has a very high spec bearing inside. And this one is fine, so we're not going to touch it. But it's also something that can be replaced. Anyway, now we're going to remove this o-ring here. So we can cut it as well. Plastic fantastic. Make sure we clean the groove. Also need to clean old Loctite here. I find the throttle cleaner removes it rather easily. Do a bit more of oil there. Now we can focus on this part. Carbon fiber doing its job, lovely. Here's the shim that we're going to clean as well. It's one. I'm not pushing the blade all the way in, just stabbing the O-ring a little bit on the front and that way I can break it without damaging the surface behind it.
Perfect. Beautiful. Flip it on the other side or in here. Oh, maybe this one comes out peacefully. Nah, just broke. We are ready to put back the impeller. I'm gonna put back the shim, same way it came out. Do the same thing with the impeller. Now we take the impeller and put it back in. So now we need to push it in or tap it in. So let's try pushing first. Yeah, I think pushing is not gonna happen. All right, obviously this is gonna take a lot of force to put it back in. I can't press it in and I'm kind of skeptical about hitting it here. So we're gonna have to take a different approach. So I'm gonna take this plate and I have longer bolts here with washers, which I'm gonna put through. And then we're gonna start uh, the bolts from the other side and slowly pull the impeller in. I think that's the safest way to do it. But let's see how it goes. Pull this out for now, flip it. And now we're gonna install this thing. Shim. And then lots of oil for this guy. All right. So I'm gonna flip this over while holding the impeller. Line up the holes. It's one. See what I mean? I think now we're gonna go with a few more washers. Now I can remove these two. All right, reached the end. It's fully seated. That was smooth. I like it. And no force on the shaft or the ring or anything like that. Just went in smoothly. Now we're gonna remove these two screws because we need to apply Loctite on them. And this is gonna stay in place because O-ring is keeping it in place. Brand new screws. And we're gonna apply again medium Loctite. That should do it. That's all of them in. So I'm just gonna snug them up. We're gonna feel when the bolt comes to the end of its travel. Like that. That's it. Now we're gonna put back the helical gears. Now brand new fasteners. Again, applying Blue Loctite. These are torqued to seven unimeters. You can't hear this torque wrench click, but that's torqued. That as well. Need to clean this half. Clean finger. So we're gonna put plenty of oil on the O-rings here. Line up our marks there and there and gingerly put this back together. So this should engage now, did. That was one. So I think we're gonna deploy Ingenuity again. And 10 mil nut and slowly push that in. So two 10 mil nuts. That's fully seated all around and safely installed. Keep in mind that this should still spin. 
smoothly and easily. So now we need to clean this part of the housing. Now you're gonna oil up the O-ring. There's a dowel that goes here. It's gonna help us with the alignment. And this we need to do very gently in order not to damage the impeller. So I think we're gonna take the same approach. So slowly jump from one side to another and do up the bolts, making sure the team impeller can spin. That's nicely seated all around and we didn't damage the impeller. Start the rest of the... So the torque for these bolts is nine. Hey, clicked. And that's the supercharger fully resealed. I'm gonna go ahead and say it's a lot quieter now as well. This wasn't that quiet before, the clutch bearing. Everything still spins as it should. So now you're gonna put back the rest of the parts. So we have a seal here and this one. Now this thing here, we have a brand new seal there. Clean this up. That'll protect that. Whoa. Remove these O-rings here. Officially done. To recap, these are the old O-rings, seals, and they are shot, plastic. So definitely worthwhile doing this. We're gonna have one happy supercharger that's not going to leak oil anymore. Good stuff, time to clean up and put this back on the car. Lubed up O-rings, of course. Line up the holes and the dowel things. Now, very important, the front bolts are slightly shorter than the rear ones. Supercharger belt. I thought I ordered a new one, but I didn't, so I just placed an order now. This one isn't looking too bad, but there's one small chip, so I don't like it. We're gonna install a brand new one when it comes. Putting the belt on really wasn't that bad. Clamp for you and clamp for you. That does need to be very tight because boost. Brand new PCV oil separation piping thing. This is actually not the correct part for this engine, but more on that later. This is an engine oil cooler that I removed from this car. And I know what you're thinking. That Alpina really nicked someone's 50 year old fridge cooler and put it on the car. They sure didn't, but one of the previous owners did. This car had a small front end accident. And from what I can tell, the bumper was cracked. The bracket where this cooler bolts to is broken. That means the cooler was broken as well. And instead of replacing it with the correct part, they just went to a garden, picked up a cooler, slapped it on the car. And in the process, butchered these lines as well. So this doesn't look good and it's not gonna provide good cooling for the engine oil. So let me show you what the correct part looks like. This is it, Alpina stamped cooler. And in all fairness, I totally understand why they went with a random one. This puppy here will set you back between 450 to 500 European shillings. And it's not available as OE or aftermarket. You can only get it directly from the dealer. And I did spend some time searching for a similar one because Bear makes these coolers for the N62 engine as well. But nothing that I saw, at least on pictures, looked like this. And I wasn't sure if it was going to fit. So I had to buy the correct one. On top of that, these two lines, and you're looking at 720 euros here. Now that's a lot of money, plus that's with discount from uh, Daniel. He works for the auto house Melkus in Dresden, so he gave me a bit better price than I would normally get. But still, quite a lot of money for cooler. We do have an issue. This plastic shroud is broken. Big piece of plastic is missing here. And of course, I didn't buy this new when I had all of this out of the car because I wasn't sure how the cooler was mounted. I thought it went something like this, 
in front of the power steering cooler, but nine, it goes underneath, very close to the ground. So for now, we're gonna use some bungee ropes to keep it in place, but first we need to install the lines. I'm using some tape to keep this together, hopefully make it easier to install. Perfect. So I have pictures of how this thing is supposed to look like, and I placed an order for the new shroud. New Gringos oil. That looks spiffy. Again, this is just temporary. I did place an order for a new shroud, and when that comes in, we're gonna install this properly. This is the cluster of the car, disassembled. And as this is US spec Alpina B7, it naturally came with miles per hour cluster. As we're in Europe now, I won one in kilometers, but these are very difficult parts to find used because rare cars. Thankfully, a really nice subscriber from the UK, Matt, has a Eurospec Alpina B7. I think he ported from Japan. And his face was in kilometers, this one, and he wanted one in miles. So we just traded. I already sent him mine, and now we're going to install this one into this cluster. It's actually not that difficult to replace. This thing just comes apart rather easily. A couple of screws, these things on the back, and it all buttons up. First, we're going to clean this. So this slides in, just like that. Now flip it over. There you go. So no coating is needed because we only swapped the face. And this one just clips in. I need to make sure it's clean though. That worked out lovely. I forgot how I pulled it out. Plug the cable in. Click. And what now? Might need battery. See if we can lower the steering wheel a bit more. Does this go more down? Nope. Nope. Then how did I get it out? All right. A little bit of persuasion. And you are in. By the way, I am looking for a nice set of wood trim for this car. Don't like this one and it's cracked all over the place. So if you have one for E65, do let me know. Doesn't have to be a wood trim, something nice, whatever. Looks great. Thanks a lot, Matt. Now we're gonna add coolant. Climate control. All right, temperature set to highest. This thing takes a lot of coolant. I don't see or hear any leaks yet, which is good. Here's where we're at. Pretty much everything on the top end is reassembled. We need to put back the air filter box, the MAF, ignition coils, and then it's ready to run. But we also need to put back the prop shaft and the exhaust. And I know what you're thinking, you can run the car without the exhaust, but we can't do that because it's going to be insanely loud. And we need to be able to hear how the engine is running. If it's making some weird noise, then we need to shut it down immediately and investigate. So what we're gonna do at this point is crank the engine over without fuel or spark to build up oil pressure. So now I'm gonna remove all of the spark plugs. The reason why I wanna do that is that way we're not gonna put any stress and pressure on the bearings while it's building pressure. And if everything sounds good, then we're gonna button up everything on the top, go underneath, do everything there, and then we are ready for the fresh start. Clean air filter box going in. It can't be that difficult, can it? Need to move the coolant tank out of the way. Now it goes in, you piece of... Assemble half a car to put something back together. Brand new air filter. Alpedo. Now I'm gonna disconnect the connector for the fuel injectors. one there and now we need to pull the fuel pump fuse as well fuse 73 is for the fuel pump the yellow one all righty the fuel system is disabled ignition system is disabled i checked the transmission fluid level it's good power steam fluid is good coolant is good engine oil is good and i also had to verify that we have a correct oil filter for this engine because if you remember we bought a brand new oil pump and it comes with the filter in it and indeed it was the wrong one this is the only filter you want to use for this engine. It was specifically prescribed by Alpina. So that's in it now. 
And as far as I remember, that's everything. We are ready to press the button and see how this thing spins over. A little bit nervous, but it's not like we are starting it yet. So let's hear it. Here we go. That's good. Let's see if we have any immediate leaks. Oh, the power string low went down. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. All right, I'm super happy with that. It sounds great. No weird noises whatsoever. Turns over nicely. So now we're gonna reinstall the spark plugs, ignition coils, the prop shaft, the exhaust, and then we are ready to start it. Brand new ignition coils, original Bosch, made in Slovenia, really good quality. So let's pop them in. Ignition coils are in. This is the prop shaft in good order. The old flux disc didn't look that great. So I bought a brand new one. New bolts as well, and the center shaft bearing is actually good, so we don't need to replace that. So let's first install this, and there is of course orientation how you install this. The arrow here needs to be pointing towards the transmission, this one, and then there's another one that's pointing towards the back, and that one goes here. And the repair manual specifically says to torque by the nut and not the bolt. That went in fairly smooth. Now I'm gonna get the rear end up in the air. Up you go. Okay, that's enough. And now I need to line up this thing here. This joint is torqued. Now we're gonna support the transmission, then I'm gonna remove the cross member, and then I can get to the nuts in the back and torque that as well. Can a torque wrench fit in there is the question. No way. I think it's time to break out my digital torque wrench. Would you look at that? My digital torque wrench fits in here. Okay, I've set it up properly now, so it'll beep. <laughs> That's fine. That dreadful task is done. Center shaft bearing 21, and I'm just gonna make sure it goes back into the same position. You can see the marks where it was before. There. Prop shaft reinstalled. Next up, heat shields, which I need to clean first. All right. And now we're gonna do the exhaust. We need to remove all the exhaust gaskets. New one. These gaskets do look like something that's going to seal really well. Ah, I'm gonna get the exhaust. How did I carry this in? Don't hit Project Crowley. Big one. Say bye to Project Crowley. So now you're gonna sneak it underneath, let it rest on the lift. Mm, yummy, yummy. I mean, I don't wanna drag you, but I will if you make me. Oh. 
In you go. But that's fine. Hey, it's in. Not quite. <laughs> Ooh. But, you know, close enough. All right, it's resting completely on the lift now. When a man loves the garbage of a car. Oh, I remember this was pretty difficult to get out. It's tight fit into this bumper here. Do not ask me how we're gonna do this because I do not know. I don't have the transmission jack. My landlord does. You know, I don't wanna wait until tomorrow. We have this thing might help us might not i don't know let's see well, so far not too bad <laughs> use my head maybe yes <gasps> oh baby Bending the heat shield. Oh, f the heat shield. I can bend it back. Did we clear the bumper? How come it's hitting the diff now? Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Wish I brought the nuts. But I didn't. I don't want to drop it. <laughs> oh, look at that. Ah, do this myself. Not too bad after all. Oh, we need tiny hands here. There's no way. I am not made of rubber. Let's try the wobbly guy. Oh, the hanger is in. Heck yes. I didn't even remember there was another one there. Why would I? Oh, that's in as well. <laughs> this car is so nice and rust free. I'm actually able to reuse old exhaust hardware. That almost never happens in an old car. And that's the exhaust fully installed. It's time, boys and girls, it's time. I rechecked all of the fluids. I think I reconnected everything. There are no loose plugs on the top or the bottom. I put 20 liters of fresh fuel in the tank. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I also really learned the adaptations for the Valtronic stuff before we started cranking it earlier. You have to do that every time you mess around with the system, like unplugging the plug or removing the motors. So that's been done and I think there's nothing else to do other than to press the button and see if she fires up back to life. This is by far the most nervous I have ever been in the history of being nervous. Will it run? How will it run? Did I do a good job putting this thing back together? Did the machine shop do a good job? What did I have for breakfast yesterday? Those are all the questions that I know the answer to. I think it was strawberry dessert or something. Oh, if she does run, good then we're gonna let it run for about 15 20 minutes let it warm up shut it down and immediately drain the oil because as much as i was careful when putting this thing back together there's always going to be some contaminants from the engine rebuild and i want to change that oil immediately new filter new oil and then we're going to start it again by the way did you know that jessica alba has a youtube channel and i have more subscribers than she does ain't that something I'm also gonna open up the secret menu so I can check the coolant temp because this stupid thing doesn't have a gauge for it. I have so much time, money, effort into this car at this point. It's, it's really, really nerve-wracking to see how she will run because he has to run good if he doesn't. Here we go. I'm procrastinating as much as I can because I'm so nervous. Come out of it. We have a flash and check engine light. Shut it down so I can read the codes. So let's plug in the laptop, see what's what. Started rather easily. Oh crap, battery's dead. 
thought I charged it yesterday. Well, that's no good. All right, that's bad. I'm gonna go get the charger. Bad battery will make it run poorly. I think all of that cranking yesterday, and then I forgot to put it on the charger. I've got updates. Found a mistake that I made. I didn't plug in that coil connector properly. Look at that. That's cylinder number seven, and it's not pushed all the way in. And if you look over there, you can see a tiny gap between the clip and the connector. So that one is seated properly. This one isn't. So let me see if I can do it with one hand. Oh, you really have to push it in. See the gap there? Now it's installed correctly. So that's why we had the flashing check engine light and it had a misfire. So I'm rechecking all of them now. Bank one is good, and now I'm gonna remove the clip on this one and verify the same thing. So Yarax from Czech Republic just told me about this. He says, this is a really common thing that people do, and man, you really have to push that connector to get it in. But just goes to show how much he knows about these engines. That one is good, and that one is good. So I only messed up one. And you really have to push that one in. The battery is still on the charger, I think we're at 12 something volts, which is not, not good. But I can't wait any longer. We need to see if this thing runs properly or not. But you know, the first start has to be eventful. It just, it has to, otherwise it wouldn't be the first start. The battery is still discharged below 12 volts, which is not ideal, but we're gonna start it again nonetheless, and the alternator should pick it up and it should run, I think. Let's see. All right, here we go again. Thirteen point five six. Hey, it's working good now. I think it picked up on the battery. Fourteen volts and charging. No check engine light. Good God, it sounds good. Smoke, some stuff burning off, leaks. Nothing immediately yet. Oh my God, it's idling perfect as well. 700 RPM, no check engine light. She's alive! No smoke from the exhaust. Yes! We have coolant spillage there that's burning off. I can relax a little bit now. As I said, ignore that. There's a lot of stuff on the exhaust manifolds as well. I spilled a lot of oil and coolant, so that's burning off. But listen to it. It's working great. No smoke. Exhaust sounds good. Alternator charging because the RPMs dropped. It's charging 13.1, but it should be around 14. Do we give it a tiny rev? Let's do it. Oh, there's the roar. Oh man, she's alive and working wonderfully. Can't wait for that stuff to burn off. Still no drips on the floor. I can't believe how good it works. Yes, I shouldn't be that surprised. Everything is brand spanking new. It never idled this good before. 69, I'm going up. So I'm gonna give it a tiny rev. That was below 3000 RPM. So we're gonna wait it to reach operating temperature. So far, so good. <laughs> I'm gonna turn the steering wheel from left to right. A couple of times. All right, we are at 91. I think with that thermostat, it's gonna run to about 95. Power string pump stopped making noise. The smoke is pretty much gone. A little bit more on that side. But just listen to it. We'll bring the mic closer. 
The clicking and stuff that you're hearing, that's normal. That's mostly injectors and mechanical stuff of the engine working. You know, before, I was just kidding. I wasn't nervous at all. Good Alpina H1 engine and the supercharger. You have no idea how this makes me happy. I think we're gonna shut it down now, check if we have major leaks underneath, drain the oil, replace the filter, and then get fresh stuff in it. It's at 95 now. Oh, my dear viewers, you have no idea how relaxed. Well, not too relaxed. I mean, there's still a long way to go. Will it last more than five kilometers? I don't know. There's a lot to consider here. It would actually fire up and work lovely from the first start if I connected that ignition coil properly and the battery was fully charged. So no leaks on the connection here, on the bottom anywhere as well for the power steam lines and stuff. I was afraid about these connections here for the oil cooler, engine oil cooler, but all of that is good. I had a ton of oil up there from when I was installing O-rings and ton of oil here around the steering rack that I was trying to clean earlier and that's the stuff that was burning off. Uh, leak from the oil filter cap, but that's normal because I reused the O-ring before when I was swapping the filters out. No leaks from the rear main seal yet. Great. And the transmission is not leaking either. These lines here, all looks good. So let's undo this plug here. Doesn't look too bad. Let's collect a little bit, see what it looks like. A bit sparkly, but that's normal after a rebuild. Okay, filter looks fairly clean. No big chunks or anything like that, which is really important. The oil itself, a little bit sparkly, but that's normal after full rebuild. And I can also see some sparkles in the old filter cap. But again, we have cast iron sleeves, new piston rings, until all of that beds in properly, we're gonna see some stuff in the oil like that, but nothing alarming so far. My running in time, it's going to be around 1,000 kilometers of sort of gentle driving underneath 4,000 RPM. Brand new filter. Lube it up. Clip in the new filter. And very important to pre-lube the filter. So fill it up with oil. You don't want a dry start. So this is my oil collection device from Liquid Moly. Finally have a proper one, huge bowl or whatever it's called. This thing here and also a mesh here so nothing can drop in. And I can also do oil changes without opening the oil drain plug, which is really convenient when I need to do a quick oil change. So you just throw this through the oil dipstick, connect compressed air and just suck out the oil. Very happy with that. It's more fun without the funnel. All right, I checked all of the fluids. Let's get it going again. Why is it struggling to start now? I'm not sure why did it struggle to start, but now that it did, it sounds good. Maybe that's something to investigate. It sounds good. Fuel pressure regulator. I don't know. Perfect RPM. Must be some of the sensors or fuel pressure regulator or something. I don't know. Reverse. Transmission engaged. Drive. She's back, that's for sure.
Just listen to it. It's working flawlessly. Beautiful idol. Lovely exhaust note. Opina B7, in case you didn't know. Love the soft close. Can you believe it? It's working that good. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So here's the deal with the crankcase ventilation on this car. It came to me with broken CCV. All of these plastic pipes were broken, then someone put this together and didn't connect it correctly. So there were a few changes with the CCV throughout N62's life. And depending on the year and model, it's going to look a bit different. But on this particular Alpina, it should look like this. You have one pressure regulator on bank two. And then on this side here, you do not have a built-in pressure regulator, but it sits over here. Then the pipe goes here and it skips the intake. This port here is blocked off. Then it goes into Y, one connection goes in bank two, and then another one goes into the supercharger. This is unique for Alpina because of the supercharger. So the pipe that I bought here is for the Alpina, but not this one because this is the one with the model that has pressure regulator built into the valve cover. So this is not gonna work. The CCV for this particular model that has the pressure regulator on the outside and connection for the supercharger is discontinued. You can no longer get it from the dealer. That means we have to put something together here and just make this work. So I'm thinking to disconnect it here and then try to connect this pipe there and then have one working CCV system. The diaphragm in this one is good, so I'm gonna remove this and see what we can do. So that's the connection that someone made. And this stuff is made by Bosch in Czech Republic. All right, now I have a clean connection here so I can use a hose or something. I don't have a fuel hose that's that thick so we can use this one. So I'm gonna destroy the connection here as well. Then connect this fuel hose to there and that'll work. There you have it, one custom CCV. You won't be able to see this because the cover comes on the top, but certainly gonna be functional and routed properly. So this plug here is, as I said, blind, blocked off. This plug here we no longer need. All right, that should work for now until I can get a better hose here. The roar is still very much there. And there you have it, folks. Alpina B7 is alive again. Working splendidly, beautifully. I wanna give a huge thank you to all of you for following along. Without you, I wouldn't be able to save this car. And a special thank you to all of my Patreons. With your support, I was also able to save this thing from getting crushed or whatever else. It came to me with a check engine light that would come up as soon as you touch the throttle. And when we found scored cylinders, I think two or three people questioned me whether full engine rebuild was necessary. And in my opinion, it definitely was because we also found bent valves and it's gonna last a lot longer now with a proper engine instead of running around with scored cylinders and wondering when it's gonna blow up. So I'm very, very happy to see it running again. And with all of this, I'm going on a holiday, fellas. I've been working like crazy past month, month and a half, putting this thing back together. Since the last video, I've been working 13 days straight on this thing, putting all of this together, because it was just, it was going really slow. I couldn't remember where some stuff went, so I had to watch my videos, how I took it apart, pictures and so on, but, but that's another thing. I really hate when I see people do engine swaps, rebuilds, whatever else, and then you just see that everything was put together in a rush. Bolts are missing, brackets are missing, nothing is routed the proper way. So I really wanted every single bolt to be back in its original place, every single wire, everything routed properly. And it is that way. So that's why everything took so long. I know shops that do this every day, they can do it in two days, swap the drivetrain and so on. But 
I am only one human, so it takes time. So I'm gonna be going on a holiday for two weeks, taking my E39 M5, my girlfriend, we're heading to Italy, then we're gonna hit France, down Riviera, south of France. I always wanted to do that road trip. So good food, good company, good drinks, good car. And once we come back, we're gonna go hard on this project and finish it completely. We're gonna change the suspension components that are worn out, and then we're gonna take it for a drive because I don't want this car just to idle in the yard with a brand new engine. We have to drive it and break it in properly. So I'm gonna get red number plates, dealer plates from my friend, put it on the car and we're gonna go for a ride. Just make sure that this engine is gonna last more than five kilometers. And then we need to take it to German Tuff, get it registered, insured. And then I can take it to my friends from Gion to Cologne. They have a state-of-the-art facility for detailing cars and they're gonna go nuts on this one and just make it look like brand new. And after 1,000 kilometers or so, after this car is fully broken in, I'm going to take it to my friend to Munich, to Oli from Oi Motors. And he's going to put this car on a dyno, see what kind of power it's making and whether it needs a tune. I'm going to say it's going to need a tune because this is a U-spec car and they always have different tunes to accommodate, well, fuel that's not as good as European one. So he's going to do his magic there and Hopefully it still makes proper power. That would certainly be nice. I think from the factory it was making around 500 horsepower, which is a lot. Thank you again for watching. This was a monumental amount of work. The most work I've ever done on some project. Well, I've done a lot of work on all of projects, but this is just, it was highly complex because I've touched every single bolt on this engine and pretty much around it and now it's working again, and that makes me really proud. I love you all, enjoy the good weather, spring is here, and I'll see you very soon. Yes. <sighs>